Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Aging with Attitude. My name is Phil Coach. I'll be Phil Koch. I'll be your host this evening. So now we have a guest, Tony Marciano, with the Charlotte Rescue Mission. Phil, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Great, great to have you. Great to have you. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about addiction, and uh, why don't you kind of tell us more about what addiction is, in your own words, and more of how it's a family problem. Phil, addiction is not one of those pleasant things that people want to talk about, but I've learned statistically that one out of four people are affected by addiction. And somebody misquoted me once and said that Tony said that one out of four people are addicts. And I said, no, no, I did not say that. Right. But what I did say that one out of four people are affected by addiction. You could have a coworker, an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a sibling, a child who's in active addiction. And addiction becomes what I call a systemic problem. Kind of goes back to when you and I were in third grade and we made those mobiles, you know, with the two sticks that were like this. And if you pulled one side, it affected the whole thing. It wasn't just pulling the one side. The whole thing moved. And when somebody has a parent or a sibling or a child who's in active addiction, it's not just that one person whose life is spiraling out of control, it affects the whole family and usually very much for the negative. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that affects everybody. Now, do you get in your center at the Charlotte Rescue Mission, do you get the phone calls when people say, hey, I have a problem uh, or there's a family member has a problem. How often do those calls come in that says, I have a problem versus I have a loved one that has a problem? Most of the time it's, I have a loved one who has a problem. Right. And most of the time it's the family member who is more vested in the person's sobriety than the person who's in active addiction. You need to understand that for an addict there is a sense of shame in their soul. Um, guilt is if I do something wrong and knock a glass of milk on this table. Mm -hmm. We can get paper towels and clean it up. The shame is not that I've done something wrong, but I am wrong. I'm defective. God knew me. God wouldn't like me. And for every addict, they use because for the few moments that they're high, it erases that feeling of shame. It's as if they fit in and they feel good. But the problem is, is that they sober up whether they're using alcohol or drugs. And once they sober up, those feelings of unworthiness return back. And so they don't want to get rid of that that drug, that alcohol, that makes them feel good and makes them fit in. So it's the family member who's calling and say, I don't know what to do, I'm at wit's end. And usually by this point, the family member has spent a lot of finances and emotional time just trying to get this person to get sober. And they will often promise the world, but yet they can't deliver on any of their promises. Mm -hmm. So. If somebody was to call you and says, I have a family member that has an addiction issue, yeah, what would be your first steps? Would you try to hear more about the type of addiction, or where would you go from there? What, do you have a set? I have a first opening sentence. Where are they living? Okay. And most of the time they say they're living with me. And I said, oh, good. So let me understand this correctly. You're enabling to continue, and let's say it's alcoholism, by putting a roof over their head and food on the table. And since they don't have to spend the money on food or housing, they can spend the money on alcohol. And then the conversation goes, well, do you want me to kick them out? And my next question is, do you want them to be clean and sober or not? Yeah. And then there's a lot of silence on the phone. And they say, how can I get them to sober up? And I've learned over the years, whether it's alcoholism, whether it's losing weight, whether it's getting our personal finances under control, that people only change when the pain of whatever is greater than the pleasure. So even if somebody is drinking and there's a lot of drama involved in that, after the drama they can have the free rent, the free food, and they continue to drink, they're happy. But if the free rent was taken away, if the free food was taken away, and they suddenly found themselves on the streets because their parents said, you're out of here. Right then the pain of using is greater than the pleasure. And that's when not the family member calls, but that's when the individual in crisis calls the rescue mission and says, I want help. I've burned every bridge. Uh, I, I've, I've lost every relationship with my family. Can you help me? So it moves from being the family member calling to the person in crisis making the phone call. Right. Can you, I'm sure there will be a lot of viewers out there tonight. I think we've all had you know, colleagues or people that we've known over the years that have 
you're not sure whether they, or maybe they're not sure whether they have an issue, a, an addiction, yeah. whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever. Is there such a definition, is there such a, I mean, at what point would you say somebody has a problem? It's somebody has a problem when it, it takes over and, and dominates their life. Okay. For an alcoholic, they're always planning, plotting, can I say it that way, how to get their next fix of alcohol oh, yeah. or drugs. Now, I'll run into people that are, are working alcoholics. They may be able to work Monday to Friday and then they binge drink on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And their whole family spirals out of control. They sober up on Sunday, they work Monday to Friday and then they binge drink on the weekends. You get others who will go two or three months without drinking, but when they start to drink, they can't stop. Um, if you and I went out for a couple of beers and I'm the alcoholic, and you drink a half a glass of, of beer and leave it on the table and go to the men's room, I will not only finish your glass of beer, but I will have 20 beers and be under the table before the night is over. In addiction, there's this mental compulsion that screams, I have to have it, I have to have it, I have to have it, and it doesn't shut up. Wow. And it's the only way to shut it up for the alcoholic is to take the drink. Once they take the drink, the mental compulsion stop, but unfortunately the physiological component kicks in, and now one beer is never enough. It's 24 beers passed out under the table, causing all the drama. It's as if truly it dominates their life. Right. And in every alcoholic's life, it's not only their life, but they have what we call a codependent. Someone who enables them to remain in active addiction. They could be paying the rent, taking care of the food, doing the laundry, making the car payments, getting the car back from the repo man, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So the alcoholic never faces the consequences of his or her behavior. And it's only when they do, it's only when they face the reality of how badly their life is out of control that they will make the phone call and say, I want help. So the, you hear about this term in, of tough love. Yeah. So is that how it interacts with addiction? Is that more loved ones that are trying to say, um, you know, no more? Tell me more about how, if you are a loved one, or what you recommend to loved ones that have other loved ones that have that addiction, how best they handle it? I don't like the term tough love. Okay. What I like is, I'm gonna honor your decision. Let, let's say that, that you're my son. Right. And that you call me and say, Dad, I was picked up with a DUI, and I'm at the police station, so I need you to come down and bail me out. Right. And my answer to you as my son is, I'm gonna honor your decision to drink and drive and get arrested. So what are you gonna do about it? Well, Dad, you're gonna bail me out. No, no, I'm not gonna bail you out. I'm gonna honor your decision to drink and drive and get arrested. So what are you gonna do about it? So Dad, you're gonna leave me here all night in jail? Well, let me take it from the top one more time. I'm gonna honor your decision to drink and drive and get arrested. Right. So what are you gonna do about it? And then suddenly the individual realizes that this person who always made the bad go away is no longer making the bad go away. And suddenly this individual realizes that they are gonna spend the night in jail. It may spend several nights in jail until they come up for hearing or whatever right. and realizing there are consequences to their behavior. Um, unless you come to that point as an alcoholic of facing the consequences of your behavior, if somebody else always makes that bad go away, right. then there's no impetus to change. I liken it to an old cowboy movie where you and I are on the saloon roof and we're shooting it out and you shoot me and I fall off the roof and there's a death and dying scene and you know I have this Academy Award death and dying scene <laughs> laying on the ground. Was well, that really what happened? No. Because yeah. when you fake shot me, I fell off the saloon roof but the director had a big blue air pillow and I wasn't afraid to fall off the saloon roof because I landed on that big blue air pillow. The director moved it to the side had me lay down, I did my Academy Award death and dying scene, and that's what the viewers saw. In every addict's life, there's a big blue air pillow that no matter how bad life gets, 
they can always know that they land on this big blue air pillow that makes all the bad, all the consequences, all the drama go away. Yeah. And when you remove that big blue air pillow and somebody lands on the hard dirt and it hurts, then it's painful. I remember having a conversation with a father whose son had gotten enough DUIs that his license was removed. And he said, what do you think I should do? And I said, I think you need to go and buy him a bicycle so he can pedal his way around town to get a job. And the father was, well, I don't want him having to bike. I said, he knows that and you know that. Right. So you're going to inconvenience your life and he's not going to face the consequences of his drinking and driving. And this is going to continue to go on. And of course, when I say those things, they never call me back because they don't want to do the tough love, as you said, to the son. But yet, if, if he would have bought his son a bike and said, here's a bike, here's a helmet, here's a water bottle, pedal your way around town, get a job, and there are consequences to your drinking and driving. His bicycling around town would have been the cause of his son walking away from his drinking to live in a life that's clean and sober. Right. Right. Those are hard things to do. It is, I would imagine, and especially when you're dealing with a son or a yeah. daughter or a mother or a father. Yeah. And let's talk about that. And this, this is not just about adolescence. This could go across all age groups, correct? Because a lot of our viewers yeah. are, are seniors. They yeah. probably have friends or people their own age that they've uh, come into interaction with that may have maybe spouses that have issues with addiction. Yeah, and one of the things I've learned, especially when you talk about spouse, <clears throat> is is that whether it's the husband drinking or the wife drinking, um, that the non-addictive spouse just doesn't know what to do yeah. and makes excuses and those sort of things. And li literally, it's as if the balance of power in the relationship is owned by the addict and the non-addict becomes what I call a dish rag. And you literally have to shift the balance of power. There's a phrase that says that the person who wants the relationship the least owns it. Let me say that again. It's the person who wants the relationship the least owns it. So in the relationship between a spouse and let's say the wife is drinking and the husband is pleading with her to stop drinking, he will sacrifice himself and cover up for her, maybe call the boss that she's sick when she's not sick, right. instead of letting her get fired from her job and face the consequences of those behaviors. Um, I've asked the question many times, let's say that you live in the university city area of Charlotte and, and you're the wife and you're the non-active spouse, addictive spouse, and you work 15 minutes from home. You could leave it 8.15, be at work at 8.30 with traffic, no questions asked. Your husband works 4 a.m. to noon off of Westinghouse Boulevard right. and comes home and gets his third DUI and is told that if he's seen behind the wheel of a car, he's going away to jail. Yeah. And that you're now going to have to get up at 3.15 in the morning and drive him to work every day because it takes two of you to pay the mortgage. And I've done this with audiences of at least 100 people for years and said, how many of you would get up at 3.15 in the morning and drive your spouse to work so that he doesn't lose his job, so you don't lose the house? 75% of the room will raise their hand as if, what else can we do? And there is another answer. And I'll jokingly say that I'm getting the car and tell your spouse to get in the car and you're going to take him to your favorite store and it's Walmart and take him to the bicycle section. And he'll say, what are you doing? And you say, I love you enough. I'm going to take you and buy you a bicycle. And while you're picking out the bicycle of your dreams, I'll get you a helmet and a water bottle and an air pump. And this is where it all falls apart. <laughs> because the addict will start making a scene in Walmart and screaming at the top of his lungs that I am not going to bicycle to work. And often the non-addict goes, I'm so sorry. Let's just go out for ice cream and I'll get up at 3.15 tomorrow. And the non-addict has to say, don't even think of touching me. Oh, and oh, by the way, tomorrow morning, you have to leave at midnight because right. it's going to be a four-hour bicycle ride to Westinghouse Boulevard. And I hope all those extra beers were worth it. And most people are unwilling to do those things. So the drama continues between the addict and the non-addict. And those things are hard because the addict will scream 
and will raise their voice and get ugly, if I can say that, to the non-addict to keep him from having to get clean and sober. So it's, it's as if you have to shift the balance of power such that the person who wants the relationship the least, the non-addict, owns it. And that's the only way the addict is going to really get the help, start going to some AA meetings, go to detox, get it out of the system, and move on with their life. What would you recommend if somebody, if you really truly believed they had be, their life had become under addiction of a drug, or is detox, is rehab, or does it depend on the circumstances? Yeah. I mean, at the Charlotte Rescue Mission, we provide 90-day programs for men, 120-day programs for women, and we know that works because the longer we can keep them under our roof, the higher probability I have of their success. Right. For the men, it takes about 65 days for it to make sense. For the women, it's about 90 days for it to begin to make sense. Why and is I that? Not to interrupt, but why, why a difference between the men and the woman? Um, because a man will rob and steal to keep himself in active addiction. Mm -hmm. And this is very unfortunate, but a woman will sell her body to keep herself in active addiction. Right. And by the time she gets to the Charlotte Rescue Mission, her self-esteem is so exhausted that it doesn't even exist. And so, you know, she can get into the front door without us even opening the door, that little space between the door jam and the, the door and the door sill, because she has such low self-esteem. Yeah. And getting her to be able to learn to say no, that no is a full sentence, takes us about three months. And, and understanding that she isn't damaged goods, that she has value, that God loves her, and has a purpose and a plan for her life, when all the messages that she's heard all her life was that she's a loser, she has no value, and truly society would be better off without her. I think the other reason is that when you go to a, a family picnic and Uncle Harry gets junk, drunk, what's her attitude? It's good old Uncle Harry. If Aunt Sally gets drunk, what do we say? She's a lush. And there's even a double standard in our society Sounds about true. when Uncle Harry gets drunk and Aunt Sally gets drunk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That mm -hmm. happens quite sadly, but, but true. There yeah. is a double standard at times, yes. And is this something, uh, addiction, maybe we touched back a little bit earlier on it, this is not really an economical issue, right? I mean, this is, goes across all boundaries. It's not a race issue. It's not a money issue, right? It's not a race issue, it's not a money issue, it's not an education issue. Very unfortunately, addiction is, is not a respect to a person's. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, it can skip multiple generations. And I've heard so many that have said, you know, that my grandfather was an alcoholic and I didn't know whether I got the gene, so I have chosen never to drink for the rest of my life. And I've heard people say that to me, and, and I admire them for doing it, because for them, one drink, and there's li literally <coughs> like an allergy in their brain that will cause them not to be able to stop drinking. So it's not a respect to a person. It's not that somebody is bad. We like to say they're not bad people. They're sick people right. trying to get well, and that's really what it is. The beauty of somebody, though, who gets into recovery is, is that they come to a level of emotional health that most of us only dream of. And while it's, it's such a debilitating disease, when somebody gets into recovery, they know a quality of life that most people can only dream of. They have good boundaries. They learn to let their yes be yes and their no be no. Uh, they don't own other people's messes. Right. Um, there's a healthy sense of self-esteem and, and self-confidence. You know, they understand that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less of the time. And if you ever meet somebody who's in recovery, there really is such a strong sense of self-confidence that's couched in humility because they're always giving the credit to God for keeping them clean and sober. Right. And yet there's that self-confidence from the work that they do from moving from a life of active addiction to a life that's clean and sober. Let me ask you, so if somebody was to go into rehab, <coughs> And during the process of the rehab, you don't feel sincerely, or your staff, that they are taking responsibility for their own action. Are they still allowed to leave rehab? Oh, they can leave any time they want. Okay. The doors never lock, and that's what I tell them. Right. In fact, I've actually told them that if you have somebody's phone number that you can call in case you get mad at me and the rescue mission staff, do me a favor, two things. Either one, go upstairs and call that person, tell them to come get you 
or two, take their phone number and flush it down the toilet bowl. Because right. either you're going to hold on to that number and you will get mad at me and you're going to call and never get clean and sober, or you're going to flush it down the toilet bowl. And unless you get clean and sober, there's no place else to go. Mm -hmm. oh. And that happens? I mean, the people will walk out? And, and they will walk out. It, it, you know, the thing that I've learned over the years is that the residents of the rescue mission are not afraid of failure. They're afraid of success. And, and people look at me and go, no, 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 they're, they're the poor you're working with, Tony. They're afraid of failure. I says, no, they can't spell failure. I can drop them in the worst drug neighborhood at Charlotte at any night at 10 o'clock. And not only would they be alive at 10 o'clock in the morning, but they would have made money overnight. Right. I don't want to know how, I don't want to know what they did. Right. They would have made money overnight and for 17 years I've asked that question at the rescue mission and 75% of the residents say, why do you keep asking, it's not a big deal. But if I drop them at 10 o'clock in the morning in one of Charlotte's better neighborhoods, in 15 minutes they will call me to get them out of there because they don't feel worthy of anything good. Really? And so we struggle with the fact that a percentage of our residents will do what we call a voluntary checkout. We didn't discharge them. They didn't break the rules. There wasn't anything like that. They just felt like, I don't want to have anything good in my life. I'm used to having drama and tragedy, and I know how to survive in insanity and chaos, and that's what I'm comfortable with. Let me go back to that. I know how to survive in failure. I don't know how to survive in success. Really? Yeah. That is so sad. It is very sad, and that's a lot of what we do, yeah. is, is getting them to understand that it's a very different world. Yeah. Having people who respect them, having people who love them, having people who are their biggest cheerleaders, having people who want them to succeed is very foreign to them, but that's all part of God's plan for their life. Yeah. And it's a very different world than the world you've walked out of, where people disrespect you and talk all manner of evil about you. And I keep going, but that's not what God has for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me more about the center. The addiction is part of what Charlotte Rescue Mission it's, is involved it's in? It's actually primarily. all of what we do. Yeah. You have to be an addict to get into Charlotte Rescue Roughly. Mission. Okay. And what we've done is we've, we've, we use a model where our counselors are clinically trained in substance abuse counseling. Okay. So their, their level of clinical care rivals a staff that would work, let's say, at a Betty Ford Center. Wow. The only difference is that we serve the poor, the destitute, the disenfranchised. So we provide professional substance abuse recovery services mm -hmm. and, and do it with a very special population that would get nice things for their lives, but we get to provide professional services. Wow. So different, Phil, if you were having a heart attack right now, I could say, don't worry, Phil, I'll, I'll operate on you. I love you. <laughs> we'll put you on this table and I'll take care of you. All right. And next week we're going to your funeral. Because I don't know an aorta from a ventricle. <laughs> and you're going to die on this table. Right. And so what we've said is, is if we're going to perform open heart surgery, not on the aortas and ventricles, but on the disease of addiction, right. let's get clinically trained substance abuse counselors to do that surgery every single day. Now, if somebody leaves the rescue mission after a rehab stint, is it, do the counselors keep in touch with them or usually not, or how does that work? We do, we have alumni programs that meet four times a year, okay. and it's a good chance for them to come back. At our holiday meals at Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter, we always have alumni come back to tell me how good they're doing. Yeah. Um, we love those sort of times. Sometimes yeah, they just call to just say, hey, you know, I'm doing well, we see them in the community. Uh, so we do try to stay connected with them. Wow. Are there, I would imagine, are there, uh, members in the same rehab center going through rehab together, non-counselors, are there bonds that form between the individuals? It's, you know, in our women's division, Dove's, Dove's Nest, it's almost like a sorority. Really? And they graduate from us to a transitional housing program, and the director there has said, it's sort of like a little sorority of all the, the Charlotte Rescue Mission Dove's Nest <laughs> graduates, of how tight and close they are. And in fact, at our men's campus, Rebound, we're in the process of renovating the dorms, and we're going to when they come back in in a few weeks, they'll be housed in quads of four. So it'll be four men together, uh, rather than the old military barracks that we had for years, to create this bond that you're talking about. Yeah. So if I'm thinking of quitting the program, I have three other guys that are encouraging me to maintain and stay in the program. Wow. Now, do, uh, just out of curiosity, I mean, do people ever get in the program and start comparing themselves with other people in the program and say, well, I'm not as really as bad as him, and try to mentally get them 
um, excuse themselves out of it, almost not take the responsibility for their own actions initially? What I've seen people do is I had some guys come to me and say to me, I can tell you why people aren't doing well here. And I said, I don't want to hear it. Because yeah. what you're doing is you're taking everybody else's inventory. And as long as you take everybody else's inventory, whose inventory do you not have to take? Right. And that's your own. Correct. And I shut them down right away. I said, I don't want to even hear what you're thinking about. Because yeah. you're here to focus on yourself. Yep. While you're here, while you're drinking and drugging, while your life is spiraling out of control. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's really, how many counselors do we have at Charlotte Rescue Mission? How many staff, generally? There's about 100 staff. We operate wow. like a hospital. Okay. Yeah. It's a 724, 365 situation. So we have to have counselors on second shift, weekend shift, you know, uh, you know, third shift, the whole nine yards. Wow. So there's always staff present. We have to do that. Wow. It's labor intensive. Again, it's it's not a shelter, although we provide thousands of nights of, of lodging every year. It's not a soup kitchen, although we provide, you know, hundreds of thousands of meals every year. Right. It's a place where people whose lives have spiraled out of control due to substance abuse can get their life back together and ultimately we want to return them as contributing members of society. We want them to be gainfully employed with a view to becoming business owners. We want them to have their own place to live with a view to becoming homeowners. Right. And there's a picture in my office of a nice blue, powder blue house. It's not anything special, but it's owned by a former graduate who was homeless. Really? When he came to the rescue mission today, he owns his own home. Wow. Wow. What a great success story. I love that. And you, I mean, that's something to be shared by your entire team. Exactly. As well as other members as, as a goal to shoot for you yeah. know, going forward in the future. Exactly. And yeah. it takes time. It, it's not an overnight transition. You know, we like to say if you were drinking and drugging for 20 years, it's like walking out of a forest. It's going to take you 20 months to walk out of the forest. Wow. Wow, that's, that's great. What a, what a nice thing um, that happens right here in our own community. That, that uh, it, It's something that people can look towards as as a resource for their own loved ones as, as well as themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'm very, very impressed by this. Tell me again where the address is. There's two addresses. Uh, Charlotte Rescue Mission Men's Program is on West First Street right. in the Shadow Bank of America Stadium. And our Dev's Nest Program is on West Boulevard, a mile past the Stratford Richardson YMCA. Great. Thank you. Reverend Tony Marciano from the Charlotte Rescue Mission. I really appreciate your being here. I want to thank you all of our viewers here tonight for joining in. Thank you for joining us for Aging with Attitude. Phil Koch.